let's pick up from where we left off. Uh, at the end of the last, uh, let me just turn the music down. At the end of the last episode, we were exploring tops and what we can do with them. And a very basic example is we took a number of different inputs and then composited them onto an image in real time and then used a bunch of altering effects and 2D asset creation to make this sort of fake sunray effect in the top right corner. And that is a good overview to get you started with the top parameters. But Touch Designer is a multidiscipline sort of powerful tool and Chops channel operators allow us to augment and control different data and variables inside of our environments. So first thing we need to look at is what is a chop? So let's ask derivative. Here we go. Short for channel property, a powerful technology which enables processing of motion data, audio, on-screen controls, MIDI data, controls from input devices. A chop contains one or more motion curve or channels. A chop modifies the channels and passes the channels to meet the next chop in the network. Chops are then connected in object motion or any other animated part of touch server via exporting and channel references. So in essence, it is the ability to hold, control and manipulate data, whether it be a single sample like this in one channel or multiple samples in a channel. This being a snapshot, so one value, and this being let's say uh, a sine wave of 400 samples. So there are 400 points that have a different value. And we can simulate that inside Touch Designer. If we bring in an LFO, which stands for a low frequency oscillator, and a great place to start for making data randomly or control data inside your patch, you can see that I have a snapshot that goes between zero and negative one and one in a sine wave. And we're seeing a single channel with a single sample. But if we attach it to something like a trail chop, a trail chop takes that channel that we to bring in and samples it over four, uh, or it, it says four, but that is four times our four seconds and there's 60 frames in a second. So we have uh, 240 samples here because 60 times four is 240. And you can see that the value at 240 is always equal to whatever our sample is. Whereas our sample is showing that only value, but then we get our, our history of the data over time. Another way to view this would be is if we open a DAT with a CHOP2, we can drag and drop our LFO into it and we see a single value. Whereas if I copy and paste it and then drag and drop our trail, we get 239 because zero indexing uh, channels inside that LFO. So even though these pieces of data are fundamentally showing us the same thing, it's two very different ways of accessing and using it throughout our patch. And we'll use chops for a bunch of different things. They will, they're will they great ways to hold and handle the data that we're gonna use, whether it be manually by making a value, something like a constant and setting its channel value, or in the case we have here of an LFO that we're using to manipulate data as and when we want. The last part of the derivative mention is where it talks about exporting and channel references. And that's because you can't link a chop in a top chain. Purple nodes will only connect to purple in the same way that green nodes will only connect to green nodes. There's no way for me to connect the purple to the green. So what we need to do is we need to reference our chop value somehow in our tops. So if I add a transform to the end of my chain, uh, that will let me manipulate the whole object. You can see I can move it left and right or up and down. If I wanted to use my chop value to control the transform, I want to put this value here, so channel one, into this operator. And the easiest way to do that is to activate your chop viewer until we have the, the little triangle. Highlight your value with green, click, and then drag onto the parameter where you want to take it. And you'll see symbolized by the, the little plus arrow, uh, the arrow with the plus, that if I drag and drop it, it'll give us a bunch of references. So expert chop is going to do uh, 
an export. So it's literally going to take a copy of whatever this value is and place it in there. If we undo that, we have something called a relative chop reference, which is programmatically going to reference this chop. We also have chop reference, which is going to uh, programmatically reference this exact chop. And then we have current chop value, so we can literally just take three and put it in here. The most common ones that I use in my touch editor development are relative chop reference or chop reference, depending on what you want to do. Chop reference is really good if you plan on moving this data around later and encapsulating it, uh, which we'll get onto when we look at chops uh, and comps a bit more, sorry. Uh, the idea that if I set the full link to this, I can now I can now place this node inside here and it still retains its link to the chop that is in the level above it. But we will cover that in more detail when we look at building more fluid programs. But for now, I have a chop that allows me to manipulate my value. So that's not a great example of usage. Let's delete our transform. I'm going to bring this out to a null and then I'm going to scroll out until I go up a level. And in my project, I am going to go to the look panel and change background top to be null one, that null that we just created. So from now on, this is always going to be the end of my processing chain for my tops. I want, and I've set that to be the background of my main project container. So now if I went to perform mode with F1 or the button, you'll see that I get a full screen of my top because that's what I set my project window to be and that project is feeding this window. Again, don't worry about the semantics of this right now. In here, I'm gonna split my window into three. I'm gonna scale my right side down a bit. So I've got my main network editor with my uh, parameter window. I'm gonna change my top left to be panel and I'm gonna make sure panel is set to my project one container, this one here, project one. So now we're seeing a non-bordered version of this inside here. If I came back and turned off the sun color, for example, you can see that the entire sun disappears both in my pipeline and in my perform window. Normally, I would use the bottom right window as a text editor, but we're going to try and avoid using all Python at the moment until we better understand the fundamentals of Touch Designer before I start, it starts getting too crazy. So for now, we'll leave this on text stat and we'll ignore it. Okay, let's animate our walking woman. Or even better, can we animate our Uh, sun rays. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so I went to my top pipeline, and after my initial comp on my sun ray, I'm gonna and before the blur, I'm gonna insert a transform. And all I want to do is I want to slightly wiggle the rotation of my sunbeams. So to do that, I'm going to import a chop, LFO. Uh, I'm happy with a sign ramp just now, so this will go smoothly between negative one and one, but the values are way too high. If I imported this into my rotate, so again, activate the viewer, drag and drop it onto rotate and do a relative reference, The rotation is slightly too aggressive, or not aggressive enough, depending on your taste. So, I'm going to take my LFO, and I'm going to insert a maths. This is a core method of creating values inside Touch Designer, and then manipulating them however we want. Because nearly all values that we access, whether it be a button, or a slider, are going to have a normalized value between 0 and 1. Whether the button's on or the slider, it's always 0 and 1. 
And 9 out of 10 times, you're going to want a value that is not only just 0 or 1. And to do that, we use a chop, a maths chop. And the maths chop allows us to take our values and do a number of things. First thing we can do, so if I offset these two, right, let me reset them both. Okay, so now I have two LFOs. They're in slightly different scales, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, they are still producing between 1 and 0. So now, when this one is a negative 1, I'm going to reset it. So now I have two values that are slightly different scaled. I could int introduce them both to my math, and then combine them by, say, adding... Uh, sorry, combine chops by adding them. So now this value plus this value is our solution. Divide them. Average them. Length, and so on. You can also, if we were to introduce a constant that had multiple values, so a constant, I'm going to add a second channel, make one of them 10, one of them 5, and I'm going to introduce a math. I can also combine the channels coming in. In this case, I can add them all together, average them, or off. Where you use these and how you use these is going to be up to you, and you'll sort of know every time that you need to do it. A prime example would be if you bring in an audio track. Uh, oh, that's my voice. If I bring in an audio file, this is music, but it has two channels. So one thing we could do is we could pre-combine them with an average, and we have a mono track that we could then analyze and start to we could then use these chop values to uh, to analyze the other track and get like a, a beat or similar right, okay let's delete all of that for now batter original so we have one LFO that's going between negative one and one into a mass that has nothing happening to it. And what I want to do is I'm going to go to the range tab and alter the values that we can get out of it. So our chop can go from negative 1 to 1, but I want it to give us a value that's actually between negative 2 and 2. Then you can see the mass does exactly that. So it still stays in scale. So we attach a trail to both of them. the red being the original LFO, the mass being the yellow. They're both the exact same, yet now it's scaled between 0 and 2 and instead of 0 and 1. A more drastic example would be so now again I've changed the range from 0 to 1 to 0 to 10. Still in perfect scale, but it now goes up to 10 rather than just 1. And you can see the effect on our sunbeams. So let's control that a little bit. Perfect. So there, I changed my range to zero profound to crush it slightly, and it just slowed down the rotation on my effect. Next thing I want to do is I want to explore the idea of manipulating my content. I'm just doing some maneuvering here to organize my network. Very specifically, I want to change the way that my islands look. I want to add a special manipulating effect to that top that is controlled by my uh, by my interaction. So I want to push a button. That when I push that button, it adds an effect. So I'm going to use chops and export them to chops to control a bunch of different values. I'm going to clean up. No. Clean up what I don't. I'm using here at the moment. And I'm going to delete them. So now we have that controlling the rotation of our sunbeams. And down here, I'm going to create a component button. We don't need to understand exactly how, what this is doing, but we do need to understand how a container or a component, uh, component tops work. 
uh, component operators work, sorry. So component operators work in the sense that they can create containers for pieces of code, but they can also hold visualizations and different levels of rendering. In the same way that we have our girl, the planets, the sun, all layered up as if they were Photoshop layers, we can do the same with entire components. Now that I've added the button, again that was comp button, you can see that it's actually appeared on my panel viewer in the top right, as it is in our main container. And this is because a button is a fancy container, and a container shows whatever is on whatever tops are inside of it. In this case, it is a single that is that has a text value. Okay, we're back. So a container is basically just a collection of a load of operators. And if we scroll in, so I'm just going to literally scroll my mouse towards the button container. You can see it contains a dat, contains a top, and it contains a bunch of chops. These chops specifically are referencing something called the panel, the unit that the button is stored inside. It tells me states when it's rolled over, when it's clicked, and then we use them to control values inside the button. If I was to create a blank container and change its background color, turn up the alpha, you can see it creates a 400 by 300 window inside our 1080p screen that I can then manipulate and control in the same way that I can control the button. In a case of something like the other example we use, the HapQ encoder, it does the exact same. It has a bunch of subset containers inside one master window that allows us to have layers of effects and panels on top of each other. You can see I have the same setup I just described to you, so my previewer, my coder, and then my actual network. Whereas in here, so at the moment we are seeing our base screen, the splash screen, and when I click it, it then hides this splash screen, so if we look at look, display is off. This is programmatically controlled, so it won't let me turn it back on. But now display is turned off, we can see the layer underneath. And the same thing happens in here, where on our left hand panel, we have layers that programmatically sit above and on top of each other that then change as and when a user controls something. In this case, when we switch between their parameters message, you can see that it disables and enables a different type of parameter, uh, container. Each container has a bunch of different content inside of that. So not only are there a way for us to store collections of code, there are also a way for us to layer windows inside other windows. And when you get onto further installation design, this idea will be uh, used throughout in both A, the controlling of it, so what you do as uh, the controller, whether it be buttons you're pushing to trigger things, or as uh, the actual windows that are shown to users inside your experience. So back to this example. Containers create spaces that allow us to move around inside a master container, all of them parented from a top. For example, on this layer, I'm not inside any container at all. Project one is the very first container of my project, so that's the biggest. And inside that, I have smaller containers that then make up individual elements of it, e.g. the button of this black space. There's another type of container called a base that still allows us to contain code but it doesn't have a visual property. So you would use this to build functions or very specific tasks that don't require a visual output or manipulation in your world screen space. But again, we're going too much into cops. I made a button. My button, inside of it, has a bunch of panel state rollovers that output a comp, eh, a chop. So to collect that, I'm gonna add a null to my button just by right clicking the green chop linkers, uh, right clicking and then adding a null. That will allow me to visualize what my button is outputting. I'm also going to make a change that includes 
uh, how my button that changing how my button works. So at the moment, it's built to something called a toggle down, which means that once clicked, the button will remain one, and when it's clicked again, it will go back to zero. I'm going to change it to a momentary, which means that while the button is clicked, I'm holding my mouse button down, it will be one, and any time it's not, it will be zero. And visualizing that, we can see that while my mouse is clicked, you can see the select in the middle there is V1. And then when it's not, it's off. So we use special parameter panel values we can get in comps, uh, in chomps from a comp to control our button. Don't worry if that doesn't make any sense. We will come back to that. We don't need to understand how the button's working, just what it's doing. So now I've changed my type to momentary, and when I click it, it's either on or off. Right, now let's program the effect we want to actually happen. So I'm going to bring my button out of the way, and I'm going to insert a level. And I am then going to right click and add a comp after that. I'm going to add two more levels and connect them both to my comp. And do top I think or maybe over so now I should have three levels going into a comp and it doesn't look like there's any visual difference to my experience but in this level I'm going to go to my RGB tab and I'm going to remove everything but the blues in this one I'm going to remove everything but the green and in this one I'm going to remove everything but the red now I'm going to change my Yeah, I'm going to change my composite type to add, so it adds these three channels back together, e.g. the green, the, let's do it in order of red, the green and the blue, correctly, so that we split it into its three channels and then mix them back together. And it doesn't matter which order they're in, because there are no, uh, how to explain this, so it's, each component is made up of four channels, R, G, B and alpha, and we removed the R, the G from uh, this, the R and B from this, and the G and B from this, so that when we add them back together, they all equal one again, as in original colors. We are going to insert a transform after each of our levels. So if we were to experiment with moving our shapes, We can see that we start getting this amazing uh, sort of channel splitting effect without doing very much work. And that's what I want to create whenever my button is pushed. So when the button is held, I want to split them. And when it's not held, I want them to be normal again. So I'm gonna reset all my parameters. I just selected all three of my transforms and right click reset all. And now I need to work out, so I'm gonna, I can either translate on the X or the Y, so to the left or to the right, or up and down. And I can also do it differently in all three. So I know that when I push my button, I need to create three random values and then manipulate my uh, position based on that. Okay, sorry about the break. So we need to use our one button press to randomly create three different random numbers that then manipulate this. So a manual way we could do it is if we just add three maths and then we make this one go from 0 to 1 to 0 0.01 to 0. Point and 0, 0 0.025. And then going to use a merge chop to bring these all back together. So I have my three values. And then I can just simply link these all into my transform. So I'm gonna take V1 in here, V2 in here, and V3 in here. And just to mix up a little bit, I'm gonna do this one, but times negative one. So now when I push my button, you'll see it displaces my effect. But I don't like the way that it instantly happens. So to control that, a fantastic 
element we can add is uh, I'm going to add a null in here just so I can control all of my values. Sorry, I should have added a null here. It's always good to pass your parameters from a null so that if something goes wrong, you can go in and change them. So I'm just going to relink all of these. And again, I'm going to click to expand it and times negative one. This, when you click the parameter, you can see that the blue indicates their expressions linking to here, visualized by the gray dotted lines rather than the solid colored line. When you click it, it shows you the programmatic reference that Touch Designer automatically makes for us. This is using Touch Designer's Python module to go and reference this note. So you can see it's saying operator, the name of a note, null four in brackets, and then v3, the name of the channel we want to get from that chop. All I did there is programmatically, I told it to alter that value somehow. So you could do anything from plus 10 to divide by a thousand. So we will come back to this in a second because I'm going to show you another way to randomly create and alter values. But back to the original problem I'm trying to solve is when I click it, I want it to slowly, I want it to ramp from zero to one rather than simply just accelerate there instantly. To do that, I'm going to insert something called a lag. Chops, whether an LFO, a button, or a constant you're controlling, associated with a lag, is a brilliant way to control the flow of values, especially when working in a real-time state. So now when I click it, you can see that the lag delays both the acceleration up and the acceleration back down, both when I click and release the button. So it no longer snaps instantly into place, but smoothly ramps on a gradient. And we put these values into a trail. The first three being the ramp, and the second three being the initial. You can see if I click it, we can see the difference in the effect that it generates. In our lag, we can change the speed of our gradients or our ramping. So now uh, a, this is 0 0.4, so it takes almost half a second for it to reach its peak value. And you can see the difference it creates to the curve. That I need to hold the button for longer to be able to actually reach the full value of 1. Otherwise, it's peaking at around 0 0.7 or so. So 0 0.2 is the default and normally a really good value if you simply just want to remove the sharpness of something like a button or a channel change. But that's a fairly convoluted way of doing it and it means that our values are only ever going to go to the ranges that we set inside our maths. But what happens if that we could randomly create a value every single time this button was pressed so that it is a truly computerized real-time environment and all we're doing is interacting with it and the effect is being generated by the computer? Well, as you may have guessed, we can actually do that. But we need to do it with a program, uh, with programming rather than chops. <coughs> so. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to leave that where it is and I'm going to make a second button. I'm going to make this one slightly longer so I can recognize it. And I'm going to move it to a similar position to my button. In this one, I'm going to scroll inside and change the name of my text top to be random gen button. So you can see the difference name here. If I push perform, we can see the two. So now I have random gen button and button. I'm still going to add a null. I'm still going to change its type to momentary. So one button that is hard coded and another button that is programmatic. And to do that, we need to use a DAT. DATs are. Right, touch designer tells what a dat is.
So here we go. A dat or a data operator. I used to hold text like strings, scripts, XML, data that contains multiple lines of text in a script, or a row of tables in a column of cells, each containing one cell. It's basically just a way for us to handle data, and that data is normally a text type. So whether it be a program uh, or a Python script, all the way to uh, a table loaded from a Excel spreadsheet through to something we've skimmed from the web. Okay. So I am going to import something called a chop execute. And you can see by its description, we'll run its script on the values of a specified chop change. You can specify which channels to look at and trigger on their base values changing in various ways. Bring it in and you can see that we get a bunch of text in our pink box that has a bunch of related values. So what I'm going to do is I need to tell this green chop to trigger this pink dat. And as we know from above, we can only link similar colors together, so purple to purple, green to green. And in this case, we want to link the two. So in the same way that I export its parameters, I'm gonna drag and drop the whole node onto my dat. We see the same arrow with the plus appear. And now it's snapped its name up here into chop and a gray dotted line has appeared between the two. So now I have my button triggering this chop execute. And if I push right click, edit and text. And it's gonna come over to where I set up my third window and show us the text that's inside this container. So we can hide it and this will still say the same. So okay, so what do we have in here? In here we have a bunch of preset Python functions ready to operate whenever this dat execute is run. And what that does is you can see we have a bunch of toggle boxes and each toggle box relates to one of the functions inside of it. What each of them do depends on what is activated. With value change on, only the bottom function is currently going to run. And any time that the number inside this chop changes, it will activate this function. To demonstrate that, I could write print and then val and then view my text board. And now every time I click my button, it's going to show me an update here. I could use the theory of the lag that I showed you before to curve that value. And you'll see that as I click it, even though I'm not pressing the button anymore, the value in here is changing because this chop is updating. So even though I've not long uh, I am no longer clicking it, it's still we're getting a curve of data in here. That is how uh, chop execute dat works. Off to on would only trigger when this value goes from being less than one to one or greater. So in here I can do print val. Yeah, I'm actually gonna do off to on plus val, and here I'm going to do val change, and then now with off to on turned on, what, oh, I need to, val is a number and you can't print a number in a string print. Okay, so now when I press it, you can see that when I click it, off to on triggers and tells us the value and val change tells us the value. When I let go, only value trigger or only value change triggers because the value is not going from off to on, it's going from on to off. And we don't have that function operating and we don't have anything inside that function. We can also do things that while off, so while the value is zero, while on, while the value is greater than one off to on when it goes from being one to zero and so on and so on. For this, we're gonna disable value change and only execute on off to on. So only whenever that button is equal to one, so being pressed, we want to do something. So I can actually get rid of all the rest of the functions. And what I want to do is I want to use a special Python function called import math actually import random and I want to create three variables 
So I'm going to say value one is equal to random dot random. Value two is equal to random dot random. And value three is equal to random dot random. So now, whenever I push this button and it's equal to one, my off to on function will execute. And in here, this random uh, library that's built into Touch Designer is going to generate a random number for us between zero and one. Between zero and one, floating. So it creates a random number if we print them. So if I do print value one, value two, value three, clear a text for it and run it. You can see that we get three random floating numbers every time we click it. And it only executes once whenever we click the button rather than continually streaming it. That would happen if we say had while on. So, I've got two things I need to do now. The first is I need to do something with these random numbers, and the second is I need to have a place in my network for them to go. And to do that, I'm going to create a constant and call it randoms. I'm going to activate three channels, so I'm going to have one, two, and three. Now, there's no way for me to link in the same way we did with this by dragging and dropping this dat to this chop because all of its data exists in code, not in touch designer parameters. So via code, we need to tell it to put values inside here. And we can do that almost the exact same way as if I was to drag V1 onto transform using code like this. For a chop, uh, for a chop constant, it's slightly different than this line here, but the parameters are still the same. So the first thing I need to do is reference the operator, in this case is randoms. And then I need to tell it which parameter I want to change. So if I look at my chop, I can expand this and see that its name is name zero and its value is value zero. So I'm going to do dot par for parameter value zero is equal to value one. And now when I click my button, Channel one in my chop is going to be set equal to the random number that's generated by our program. I'm going to copy and paste this code twice. I'm going to set this to one and set this to two because I know that the second channel is value one and the third channel is value two. So now every time I click it, I have three random values being generated by my button. I'm going to add a lag and then a null. So now it will randomly move between the values it creates and it will slope in doing so. It won't just dramatically change. If we take this null and connect it to our transform, so we're going to have one, we're going to have two, and we're going to have three. So we can see this is technically working, but the main problem with it is our values are just too big. So going between zero and one moves it far too far for the, pro, for the transform, which is working in a fraction. So when it says 0 0.78, it's actually moving it by 75% over to the left. We could change it by pixels, but given it's using a, a, such a small number, it's not going to move enough it's now going to move less than one pixel in total. So we won't see anything because all of our values are less than one. So we'll change them about to fractions. And 
we're going to go and edit our value that is actually controlling. We could do this with a math and just say instead of going between 0 and 1, go between 0 and 0 0.1. And already we have more option. But I actually want to introduce a negative to this, so I'm going to just go between negative 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. Might still be a bit drastic, so in maths, I'm going to go from 1 to 0 0.5. There we go. And now we have it randomizing our data on top of itself. The last thing we want to do is alter it so that we can return to normal. So if I delete all my extra button information, we need to create effectively what is a gate. So we want all these values to be zero unless this button is pressed where it lets them come through. So I'm going to add a final math. And then I'm going to combine the chops by multiplying them. So now I have a random, I can randomize my values, you can see represented inside the lag here. And I have a button that then lets those pass through. The reason we're not visually seeing it is because by adding this multiplication, we change the name of the channels coming out of our null. And you can see that all of our tops are now erroring, saying argument must be a string, not none type. So I can go in here and my new channels are v1. So I'm just going to type these by hand. So now click the button and it activates it. Let's put a little lag on that so it smooths the maths. So there we go. We can push a button to do it. And then we can re-randomize their positions as well. So that was a first introductory look at chops referencing and linking them inside Touch Designer, as well as a very quick look at the introduction of the DAT component, as well as Python integration inside Touch Designer. So a bit of everything. But in the next lesson, we will go a bit further with our chops, looking at how we can analyze data that we bring into Touch Designer rather than data we create inside of it.